Um, a little bit different presentation from me today uh, for the reason that I don't currently have any experiments here where I have live measurements of soil water. So for once, I'm a little bit blind to what is actually going on underneath the surface of the soil. I might be a bit blind to what is actu the actual number under the sur surface, but I think I've got a pretty good educated guess, as, uh, as plenty of uh, people here would also have an educated guess of how the conditions are. So I'm going to take a little bit of a different tack today. First of all, I want to extend out the timeline. I want to broaden our view out to the last 30 years. And I'm starting in 1990, because that's about my point of reference. Some here might have a slightly longer point of reference, but I'm 1990. Others are a bit shorter than 1990. But I want to paint a picture from 1990 and remind, uh, see what that means. Then I want to remind um, ourselves that yes, uh, rainfall conditions obviously have a strong bearing on soil water and the amount of soil water has a strong correlation with how much plant productivity we're going to get. I'll drill down a little bit narrower into the last 12 months to the last six months, last five months. Have a look what we've seen there. From our lessons learnt in the past, paint the picture of what that presents moving forward from now. But then also, just reflect upon what we've heard late yesterday afternoon from the Bureau of Met in that they have now formally declared El Nino in, in play and together with a positive Indian Ocean dipole. So they both have ramifications for the outlook moving forward. So that's the broad synopsis. And in the handout, there's lots of interesting notes there I put together uh, that are probably well worth a read. Um, I'll try not to refer to them as I go along because it's a bit hard flicking and chopping and changing with uh, words and graphs and so on. Now, looking back, 1990. Who has heard uh, or has seen a rainfall chart known as a change plot? It's a very common tool for hydrologists. Hydrologists like to use them because change plots can help us pick when stream flows and those sorts of things start and stop. And a change plot for rainfall, it's quite, quite a simple concept, but very, very instructive. And I'm choosing this because, well, we've all got rain charts at home. We can all have a look at this ourselves. A change plot is, if you like, a cumulative uh, budget, a cumulative tally of whether monthly rainfall is above or the below the average. So for each month as it goes past, we've just finished August, what's the average rainfall for August? I don't know, what is it, 50 millimetres let's say. How much rain did we get? Oh, we got 20. Okay, so we're 30 minus 30 millimetres for August. And then we go to the next month. What do we get for September relative to the average? If it's above average, we add the difference. If it's below average, we take it off. So through time, we build up this trend of either a decreasing trend, getting further and further away from the averages, or an increasing trend of being above average rainfall. And when I do that for Tamworth from 1990, Starting at 1990 was a real ch was a change point because it changed from the wet 70s and 80s. People who were around in the country music festival in the 1980s swear that you couldn't have a country music festival without a flood because that was the experience in, in those years. Summer rainfall, summer floods, clean up all the campers off the playing fields and it happened routinely. But from 1990 we entered a strong and a long progression of below average rainfall on month to month basis. Sure, there were short term spikes back above the average, but from 1990 
all the way through to the end of the millennial drought. So around 16 years, the prevalence was for monthly rainfall totals to be below the average. By the time we got to end of 2006, the end of the millennial drought, which really wasn't just the millennial period, it started in 1990. That's when the trend started going backwards. 2006 through to, um, I need to look at my graph, don't I? For the next few years, we had a good, strong, above average rainfall. As an observation, that phase was the period where our interest in tropical grasses became heightened. I, I nearly fell off my chair when I realised the connection. Around that 2005, 2006, DPI really started getting into the tropical grasses research. That same point in time was we started experiencing, again, above every month, monthly totals, particularly focused around the springs um, and early summers, which absolutely uh, favoured our tropical grass work. Roll forward to around 2013, we oscillated again through a short dry period, short wet period, but then along came 2017 and it stopped raining. It stopped raining for nearly three years, it seemed, and we went through a strong drying phase through to the end of 2019, and then we had 20, 21 and 22, which were all above average again. Now, when you, when you have the time and you have a look at that chart that I've got there in the, in the handout, just reflect upon what was going on at your place at around those points of change, when things seem to move. Now, why is that important? Why should, that, why should we worry about that? Why should we think about that? My interpretation of that is when, when the rainfall pattern seems to change and hits these change points, it's black and white, I'm not fiddling any numbers, that's what the rainfall record is telling us. It's a tool that we can use. Why am I interested? There's two, two things. Firstly, if we analyse the whole record of rainfall for Tamworth on this basis, and we divide up the rainfall record into the wetter phases where cumulative monthly totals are above average and drier phases when we are below average. Something very revealing pops out. Lou mentioned in her presentation this morning, Tamworth has an average monthly rainfall of somewhere around 650 millimetres. When is it average? It's never average. But when you analyse this monthly data in this fashion, what pops out is during the wetter phases, the average annual rainfall, the 12 month averages, is around 840 millimetres per year. During the drier phases, it's around 440. Stark contrast, it's nearly two to one. So that's the first, first message to come out of that. Our wetter phases, pardon? Got the average. <laughs> well, the average, if you divide it all out, it'll come out as a fat average, but the experience is we don't have 650, 650, 650. We have blocks of time when the average is either more like 840 and blocks of time when the average is more like 440. Which one are we in now? I think we're rapidly heading, if already in it, rapidly heading to that phase when we're dealing with 440 average rainfall. So what does that mean strategically on farm? Are we going to go out all guns blazing this year and sow a new pasture? Risk on or risk off? Are we looking to undertake major capital improvements? Where does the cash flow come from? Risk on or risk off? So I think it's a really interesting framework you can apply to where are we currently sitting and what that might mean for some of our broader strategies on farm. 
another point I want to draw out, Lou also mentioned it a little bit. Another point I want to draw out, if you look at that chart as it goes up and down, the slope of the changes, so the progressively holding a wetting trend or flipping over and going into a drying trend. What I've noticed particularly, and it's your experience too, this last six to seven years is the speed at which things have changed. That, that drying phase 20, uh, that culminated 2017 to 2019, the speed at which the rainfall dropped off and the steepness of that curve, if you, that plot, if you have a look at it on the chart, representing less than one percentile rainfall value. Now percentiles are very useful, sometimes they're a bit difficult to wrap heads around. But for that equivalent length of time, which is just under three years, that three year period was drier than greater than 99% of any other three year period in the rainfall record, doesn't matter where you start it or stop it. That three year period was effectively the driest three year period in the rainfall record. Then we flipped in 2020 through to the end of 2022, that three year period was all but the wettest ever in the rainfall record for Tamworth. How do you manage with that? How do you manage with that? It's dang hard. And now, if I look at those numbers from November 2022, and we're now half, three quarters of the way through September, we've only got October to go to complete a 12 month cycle. If I look at it from November 2022, we're currently sitting at around decile five or six. So this last little phase is among the driest 5% of times. I, I can't wrap my head around how quickly that has changed um, and what that means on farm, dealing with forage production, planning for forage production and actually achieving that to run through the livestock system, incredibly hard, incredibly hard. But my message there is, I think the rainfall record is an incredibly useful tool to put us into perspective of where we are now and possibly what's, what's to come. Now, anyone who's heard me talk before, I always like to reference what the current soil water conditions might be and what that might mean for the next little while in terms of outlook of, of pasture growth. Now, tropical grass work, over our years of doing this work, we've clearly demonstrated or observed and demonstrated that the tropical grass pastures are very effective at storing winter rainfall. Because they're not growing, are they? They're frosted off and dormant. So they're very effective at capturing any winter rainfall, holding that in the soil root zone to kickstart our spring growth. So first piece of information I wanna know is, how much rainfall did we have in the cool season this year? <laughs> not as much as what we would like, not as much as what we would expect, possibly half as what, as what we might expect. My number here from that, that rain gauge, um, is 87 millimetres. We've had for the four months, uh, May, June, July and August, 87 millimetres. That's in the bottom five percentile of years. It's really low. The other thing I noticed from the weather record for this period of time is our maximum, our mean maximum daily temperature is back up again. Clear sunny skies, warm winter days, great for um, doing recreational activities, not much good for some other things. So our daytime temperatures have been up again. We had three years of quite cool winter conditions, 2021 20, and 22. 
daily maximas were around the 17 to 18 degrees. This year it's up at 19 degrees. 19 rings a bell. Go back to the 2018, 2019 years and guess what? It was the same. Mean maximum temperature is around that 19 degrees or 19 degrees plus. With extra sunshine and extra temperature, what does it also give us? Extra evaporation demand. So although we had 87 millimetres of rain in the gauge over the cool season, our daily temperatures were up, our evaporation rates were up, so how confident am I that we stored that 87 millimetres in the profile? I, I, I'm guessing 30% of that maybe, 30 to 40% maybe. Um, so my message is, coming out of a, a winter that we've just had, no, we haven't built up the buffer of available soil water that would typically drive our spring and early summer growth, particularly of our tropical grasses. So what do I glean out of that? Don't expect a big one. I just don't think we're going to get it. Um, the rainfall and the soil water story is compounding. So even if we do get rain, it's on top of a, a dry upper profile. That little drop of rain is going to just fill the spaces. It's not going to be so much plant available. So yeah, it's all compounding. So yeah, we've had a change in what appears to be a change in the, the periods from a wet phase back to a dry phase. We've had a pretty dry and warm winter season, which is not good for accumulating water heading into our, in our spring and our summer. So what do I learn, what do I think, or what do I learn looking forward into the spring? Well, if we don't have that base of stored soil water in the profile, we don't have a buffer. We don't have a buffer to carry us through from one rainfall event to the next. We don't know when we're gonna get our next one, so the buffer is important. If we don't have that buffer, what does the plant see? What does the grass see? The grass sees these sporadic opportunities for growth. Sporadic, short and sharp, stop and start. What does that mean for feeding livestock? For the forage base for livestock? One, our quantity is not going to be anywhere near the same. Two, the quantity is going to ebb and flow really quickly. And three, quality is going to be all over the place and that's why tools like the ag360 can be extremely helpful we tune that to your local soil conditions and your local pasture base um, i'm familiar with the ag360 so so i can help do that as well tune the ag360 to your local conditions and then you've got some reference points to move forward now, did anyone miss the announcement yesterday, that three, three o'clock announcement from the Bureau of Meteorology? It seems to have been pretty heavy in the media for the last uh, 12 hours, 18 hours. Yeah, I was, I was on a webinar early yesterday morning. Some of you guys might have been as well through the GRDC. Bureau gave an update through GRDC about using forecasting information for, for on-farm management. And Claire, the Bureau uh, rep, um, she, she more or less said, we, we knew this was building, but our thresholds were not yet met. But in August, they triggered. So, you know, most people would have been uh, pretty sure that we're in an El Nino event, but the technical threshold had not yet been met by Bureau standards. The double whammy is the positive Indian Ocean Dipole. So they, ha they have influence over different weather systems within Australia. Um, I broadly think of uh, the El Nino weather system effect coming from the east, but the Indian Ocean Dipole coming from the west. 
here on the northwest slopes, we're exposed to both. Where, where do our main weather systems come from? Northwest. Rarely do I worry if Port Macquarie is getting rain because it doesn't come over the range. But if Alice Springs wet, then I go, hello, something's coming. And there are very strong correlations between, for example, the Alice Springs daily temperature and how much rain we get. That's pretty intuitive, really. If Alice Springs is hot and dry, what are we expecting when our systems come from the west and northwest? If Alice Springs is cloudy and overcast with a moisture bearing system coming down from the northwest, I get excited. Um, so yeah, the two together, I think, is, is likely to have a very strong influence on us over this spring and summer. So unfortunately, I don't see a lot of uh, pin the ears back and let's, let's go and do some amazing things. I think it's really time to think about how much risk, what are we carrying, what do we need to change in terms of our management, have we already enacted a drought management plan? Is that what people are doing? What trigger are you waiting for to trigger that drought management plan? New South Wales DPI has their drought alert indicator, which mainly is a backward looking uh, alert because it uses the last 12 months of information. And in the handout, I just grabbed a screenshot for Kalala Parish. So we're in Kalala Parish here. For each and every parish in the state, you can retrieve this information. And it uses rainfall, soil water, and plant growth indices to define the drought condition, whether no drought, drought affected, intensifying, severe drought, or coming out of drought, slightly drought affected, recovering. So bear in mind that the drought indicator is using the last 12 months of data to inform it. But if you have a look at the detail on the curves, so the, the soil water curve, the pasture growth curve, and the rainfall curve, they're rapidly pointing south and they're only this far away from the threshold where drought will be triggered or alerted. So take that picture, take the outlook for El Nino, Indian Ocean Dipole, low probability of rainfall exceeding the average doesn't mean we don't we get no rainfall it doesn't mean that it means we have a lower chance of exceeding our median or average rainfall totals so i i look at that and i go okay very soon there's likely to be many districts across new south wales brought into the drought declaration adding to north coast northern tablelands parts of Hunter Gloucester. Um, there's a patch emerging in these data around Narrabri. Uh, anyone that's from up that way would probably will tell you we're already there. And that's right, because these, these indicators are lagging. So yeah, I, I, I wanted to sort of paint the picture of the bigger ebbs and flows, um, long drying phase from 1990 through to 2006 a good recovery th phase to around 2013, 14, bit of oscillation, rapid drying phase, 17, 18, 19, lowest rainfall on record, rapid wetting phase, 2020 to 22, all but the wettest on record. But now we need to be prepared. We need to have plans in place and there are I've mentioned a couple of resources there in the handout uh, and Nikki can guide you to go and have a look at as well um, together with other tools available. So any questions? You know, if, if we start to have a 
one month, two months, three months below average. Okay, let's just pay attention here for a minute. Um, what are the present conditions like? Am I current coming off a, a high forage base accumulation or am I start of the, start of the growing season and I'm behind the eight ball? You know, yeah, what, it, what does it mean for the, the species behind us? You know, the annual forage mixes. If these seasons cut in and cut out so quickly, what does it mean for trying to grow some of these mixed forages? I don't have an answer. I'm just posing that as a thought. You know, uh, this spring's finished very quickly. These species are done. Um, so yeah, that's very interesting. And I, I mean, I've, I've, I ran it quickly through my mind. What does it mean for the enterprise? Do, what does it mean for a breeding enterprise? What does it mean for a trading enterprise? If we're going through the, you know, people have just got some numbers up and then all of a sudden they're running back off to the sale yards again. I don't want the numbers. I've got too many numbers. I've got to, got to lighten. Um, I think as an industry, I think there's some, some more questions there to answer. How to approach it. I can add to that, Sean. Yeah. Yep. Um, drought experience in the Hunter, where I'm from, I've just yeah, it's... a Facebook page written a, an analysis of the rainfall. Like this last January to August, is the 10th driest January to August period in 149 years. Mm -hmm. And we've had the bad drought of 17, 18, 19. And I think it's highlighted to me the, the critical importance for enterprises here, the slopes, to have subtropical grasses. They have been a savior for so many people. Mm -hmm. um, they they will grow feed for us for probably 10 months of the year. Uh, these unreliable starts to the year to get oats in. We've got rain, storm rain in summer. We can get 7,500 kilos a day and get feed for weaners when we haven't got oats. And we're getting feed growth response from subtropicals now after we got 20 odd mils the other day mm -hmm. with bugger all rain before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they are playing such a pivotal role in, in our farming system that they're putting some security in there that we can grow feed when it rains and they will grow feed probably eight to 10 months of the year. Yeah. yeah and so, not yep. die. You know, we've got paddocks that are 40 years old. Still there. Like you're not going to find a temperate <laughs> doing that in this environment. No. So you've got to look to those pastures that are going to stay with you. And I think you have to have productive annuals, particularly winter ones, on stored moisture to give you that feed going into winter yeah. where you're trying to fatten stock. Yeah, yeah. for anyone who came along to our pasture day, I think it was February 2020, I think we had one then. Um, so when the season sort of changed and the, the trial site we had back there behind me and how much material that the tropical grasses produced in that period of time it was just mind numbing really. How quick they can put on growth when they've got available moisture and temperature, etc. And, so, and nutrition. <laughs> that very important one called nutrition. Yeah. Feed them and they'll look after you. So yeah, very very interesting questions to consider. How how it affects our enterprises altogether. Um, perenniality. A resilient perennial feed base still is a mainstay and always will be. I mentioned the period 2006 through the 2013 when we really started getting into tropical grass research. If you look at that ra the rainfall record during that time, what stood out was pretty much in every one of those years, it was either October, November or December. One of those three months in every one of those years was well above average. That was an interesting artifact because by crikey, it really encouraged our tropical grasses and it really gave us enthusiasm for them because it might have just been a lucky break that we were investigating those grasses in those seasons that favoured them. Um, 
more recently, and, and that's, no, we haven't had average rain at all. And that's why I said in these phases of wet and dry, in the drier phases, we're dealing with the 440 millimetre sort of number. And in our wetter phases, we're dealing with the 840 millimetre number. We're not, not dealing with the 650 in the middle. Uh, the distribution of rain throughout the year, yeah, that's more prone to the influence, the climate drivers. So which drivers were influencing at those particular times. The SAM has been in play, the Southern Annular Mode, it's been in play this year, making all the cold fronts stay down south, not getting up here. So we've missed out on that rain. We just haven't had it. And that's what's peculiar about the Northwest Slopes. We can get rainfall influence from three directions on any given occasion. So we are, we're fortunate, we're, yeah, I've always had this discussion with uh, people who are either tr strongly tropical or strongly temperate and having this conversation just about how dynamic our, our weather systems and our rainfall patterns are here and how to juggle them and manage them compared with the more predictable temperate system or the more predictable tropical system. It's very unique. The, the rule of thumb in terms of uh, projections for the Tamworth climate moving forward uh, longer term is Warrialda coming to us. That's, that's a way to picture it. The Warrialda climate coming down to us. That's one. Um, so yeah, that has implications for, your, for the st strategy, what, what sort of enterprises are you prepared to run given that broader change? Yeah, and for, for this next summer phase, some of the questions I posed in the notes was, well, what does that mean? Uh, what does that mean for the next six months on your farm? You're running a breeding enterprise, you've got cows weaning, early weaning. How do you get those cows back in Nick for next year given the forage base that may be before us, um, things like that. Uh, if you had pasture planned to be sown this year and now you go, ooh, yeah, nah, maybe not. Um, does that mean you just quickly trash in a cover crop to maintain cover on that paddock over the summer, try to capture what you can and then reassess next year? Now, what levers have we got for, for pulling and pushing uh, to, to try and weather weather huh, weather our way through this little uh, period. Certainly, uh, I was driving home yesterday afternoon listening to ABC, and uh, they were talking to a producer from the north coast, and and he and he was saying the same thing in terms of it, the tap just turned off. You know, all those north coast floods happened, and then it seemed like the tap just got turned off, and that really set them up for difficulties with their with their annual forage program. At the start, it was too wet. They couldn't get on the paddock to get it in, and then too dry, and yeah, so on it goes. So in no way do I want to be a pillar of misery, um, but I do want to open eyes and, and try and help think about what does it mean on our farms? You know, some pretty clear messages coming through with the signals and the outlook and what we've had, so therefore, thinking carefully about what we'll do moving forward.